All right, I'm going to shut up. Alex, I'm going to let you take it away, man. Talk, Alex. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what's up, everybody? I want to give a little bit of encouragement, which is right now we're a little bit in you know the beginning of a recessionary period. I do expect that it will deepen and get worse. But the good news for everyone here is kind of two things. Number one, we have the fortune of having already gone through COVID as a community. No matter what recession has happened in history, not being allowed to do business was the worst. Anything above that, like I would so much rather have a 30% reduction in business than a 100% reduction in business. And yet still, 75% of gyms were able to stay open despite being not even allowed to be open. <laughs> For us, we feel pretty good because we went through COVID. Even through that period of time, despite a decrease in revenue, one of the beautiful things about service businesses, and this is something that everybody here can take to the bank, is that in a service business, you have a decent amount of variable expenses. If you have fewer clients, you can cut class times. You can cut trainers. I'm not saying it's fun, but I'm saying that if we're getting down to the bone, there is room. I say that only to outline that like we are in a relatively flexible business, which is nice. And so we have gone through COVID. We have been through harder times. We are well prepared or well equipped to go through a 30% or even 50% downturn. But all that to say, I think we're going to be okay. The second thing that I said is kind of the silver lining is that you really only need to worry about it if you're a loser. And I want to add context to this, which is in recessionary periods, it's not that everyone goes down by 30%. What happens is the bottom 30% goes down by 100%. The people who who were skinny dipping, who were above their pay grade in terms of how they were working. They were overselling, under delivering, not reinvesting in their team, not building a culture, not giving a fuck about their customers. These periods overall, big picture, are actually good for the economy. Unconstrained growth is cancer. Having a pruning period, if you prune a tree, it grows healthier, stronger, taller, faster, because you have to cut off the appendages that are not additive to the overall system. And so oftentimes the low performers, rightfully so, don't deserve to be in business. And so if you want to make sure that you are well equipped to get through the tough period, make sure you deserve to get through the tough period. One of the easiest things that I can like recommend is that right now, number one is gonna be focus. If you have these side doodads that you are waiting to take off and you're like, I've got this other thing that I'm doing on the side, it's gonna be awesome. I would recommend you stop that because it, it bears the assumption that you split between two ways or three ways are better than somebody else 100% invested. And remember, we're just talking about the bottom 30. You just gotta beat them. And so it's the easiest way to beat them. If I have a competitor, my favorite favorite thing in the world is to hope they get distracted. I hope they split their attention because it makes it much easier to win because I don't have to, I don't have to beat them. I have to beat one third of them. So just don't be that person. On the flip side, be the very ruthless competitor that you wouldn't want to compete against. The person who always shows up on time, that does the boring work, <laughs> that does the things that they know they should be doing and actually do them. If you were to make a list of all the things that you know you should be doing but aren't, not even new shit, I probably should be emailing my list on a regular basis and doing a promotion once a quarter. I know I should be doing that, but I'm not. I know I should have semi-privates available but I'm not because I'm lazy because I'm distracted because I let's put the real one it's not a priority because the same thing that you tell your clients where they're like I don't have time <laughs> to cook my meals I don't have time to go to the gym don't be those people you make it a priority and the people who don't make it a priority will lose and rightfully so what makes a six free challenge is a 100 million dollar offer versus non-free free versus non-free is kind of is irrelevant as far as the value that you're providing someone the free offer structure from every single test we have run. And believe me, we have run tests for a fucking decade. I ran it with my gyms. I ran it with the 30 plus gyms that we did turnarounds on. And we ran tests over and over again, because let me tell you a secret. We would rather not expend the energy overcoming people's limiting beliefs all fucking day. It would be much easier for us if they were even or equivalent in the amount of net money that a gym would make. We will make the recommendation that will make the gyms the most money because we are vested in people making money so that they can pay us. And so, so when we looked at it dollars to dollars, the cost per lead, and this is, Kale, you can bet, because I, I don't have up-to-date stats, but every time I we ran this test, it's still the cost true. per lead it's, it's still true. It's was a third free versus non-free. And close rate, guess what, was the same between free and non-free. So all we're doing is paying three times the cost to acquire. That's it. If you want to pay three times the cost to acquire, by all means do so, but do not complain about it. You cannot have the best of both worlds. That being said, when I sold the six week challenge, I never had issues with anyone getting upset. And so if you have issues with people getting upset, it's because you are not convicted. It has nothing to do with the promotion. All you have to do, I promise you, is let 20 people start for free with no money down and you'll become convicted very quickly that they need to put skin in the game. Best way we know how. It's like, I wanna make it free. I want you to win. We have a very high percentage of people who win. And this is the best way I can think of to give you a great deal and give you some incentive to get the results. Because here's another crazy 
as you want. If you measure the results on the back end of the six week challenge, the people who put the money down versus the people who had money at stake, the people who had money at stake lost more weight. So you're telling me that we get a three times the customers for the same dollars of ad spend and we get better results for the people who come in. And that is the thing I don't want to do. Okay, that's fine. Just don't complain about it. What separates those who crush from those who don't as business owners? Focus. Seriously, it's just focus. It's can you do this stuff every day repeatedly? What separates the people who get crazy results during a transformation from the people who don't? It's not anything sexy. They follow the meal plan. They show up to the workouts. They add progressive overload. They show up on time to their meetings. They interact with their coaches, service with a smile. They sell with conviction. They follow up with their leads regularly, quickly, and often. They run a play every 12 weeks and they don't stop doing that when they make a little bit more money. If you you can shift your goal from the amount of money you make to the type of person you want to be, you won't be satisfied with making 20 grand a month. Because what I see happen over and over again is people get to 20 grand a month and that was their income goal. And then they let off the gas, which means that they aren't winners. And so make the goal being a winner, because if you made 20 grand a month, you're fucking supposed to. It's like the person who loses weight and then says, you know what, I'm going to cheat a little bit because I'm doing so well, which is a complete fallacy. It makes no sense logically. I'm doing so well, so I'm going to change stuff. Continue on. Keep doing. What kind of internal work have you done to break limiting beliefs about yourself slash worth through stages of your journey, gym launch to GL owner to acquisition.com. I think what shifted is just what the goal was. Like if you think about like what you're optimizing towards, you change in reaction to your goal. And so if you want to change you, change the goal you're optimizing for. Most of us wake up every day with a question we're trying to answer. How do I get more leads? How do I sell more memberships? For you guys, figuring out what that question is for you. And if you change that question, you will change your life. Because I can tell you for me for a long time, I would say the last four years, it's been how do I increase my network? Worth. Every decision I made was, is this going to increase my net worth more than something else? I'm feeling that question shift right now internally for me. And you guys have probably seen it a little bit more in terms of my public facing brand and all that stuff. And it's been because the question has shifted. It's not being about net worth and being about goodwill. The decision lens that I use now is like, will this build goodwill? And so you can tell, like if I wanted to extract value from my much larger audience now, I could do that. I choose not to, because I don't think it's going to build goodwill. If you pick a different outcome, you will change in reaction to that goal. In terms of limiting beliefs, it's getting in community like this and seeing people who are not as good as you do better than you and then realizing that you can do it too and the only reason you're not doing it is because you're not doing the stuff you know you should be doing at what point is the lady in the red dress not the lady in the red dress and the next logical step for a business to grow everyone heard the stages of grief you know there's five stages of grief well there's also one and i don't know like the title of it but this five stages of shiny object the first stage is uninformed optimism it means that you don't know what you're talking about and the grass is greener it looks greener you don't know enough to know that there's bodies there too and it's full of shit. But you don't know that yet uninformed optimism so then you dive in and then you get her on the other side and you realize it smells like shit. And you're like, wow, informed pessimism. Now you know, and you're not as optimistic as you were before, but you continue to trudge on. And you're like, well, I did this thing. I'm going to keep moving. Stage three, valley of despair. This is where everyone quits. This is where everyone looks for another shiny object and then jumps to that next shiny object. And most people can't get past step three. They continue to do one, two, three over and over and over again. And you will continue to do that through your entire entrepreneurial career until you learn the fucking lesson. Because then you get to step four, which is informed optimism, which is that you understand the shit, but you understand that if you see it the right way, and in the right temperature, it actually grows a ton of grass. And then step five is you achieve the goal and then you reset the benchmark. But most people continue to exit at step three and go back to find another shiny object. And they do that for decades. What do you say to someone who says the leads are poor, broke, or not a good fit? We sold in the North, the South, the East, the West, in poor markets and rich markets, in Asian, Black, Native American, Hispanic, white markets. Until the day that men deem women and women deem women more attractive for being overweight, we will have a business. A sale is always made. Either you buy their excuse or they buy your conviction. Like if you really believe, and this is the thing, most people don't believe, really believe, because it's not, do you believe, do you not believe in your product or service? It's how much do you believe? Have you ever talked to somebody who's like a hardcore, person of any religion or any ideology, like drank the Kool-Aid and ever talk to them long enough, then you start wondering, you're like, maybe they're right. It's because it's not whether someone believes, it's how much do they believe? How deeply do you believe in what you sell? If you fix that, you can change everything because you also sell from the right frame, which is that you really want to help this person and you're not going to give up on them when they're giving up on themselves. And if you believe that, then no one's too broke. If they can afford a phone and they can afford a car, if they're trying to lose weight, worst case scenario, they don't eat. Win-win. I remember I had this lady who came, she was doing Dave Ramsey thing. She was like, I've got this envelope that has my groceries. That's where I would have to take this from. And I was like, well, either you figure out a way to make more money and you're fine, or you can't afford groceries and you lose weight. Either way, we accomplish your objective. What's the worst case scenario? You're gonna lose your house? No, not gonna be able to eat as much. Okay, well, that was what we're trying to accomplish anyways. Now we force you to accomplish it. If 
you were advising a big box or micro gym on branding, what's your advice and why? A brand doesn't exist. A brand's like a bouquet of flowers. A bouquet of flowers doesn't exist. It's just lots of flowers put together. If you had a single wilted flower in a bouquet, it would dramatically affect the way the bouquet looked. There's just like a rotten rose sitting there. For the most part, the brand is kind of the verbal amalgamation of disparate things. And so it's basically adding six associations together to make one verbal understanding. You build brand by getting people to associate your brand with a thing they like. So like, what do people like? And so that's why having a good product and a good service experience will build your brand. Word of mouth will build your brand more than just about anything. You can kind of separate this out because you've got the personal brand side and then you've got like a business brand side. The business brand side by a large margin is going to be dictated by the product. Brand is product minus promise. Really amazing product, really small promise, subtract it, you've got a lot left over. That's brand building. The flip side is really shitty product minus really big promise is really bad brand. You want to promise so you get people to buy, but you still want to under promise and still over deliver. I really want to set clear expectations so that I can exceed them because I know that that's the long play. There's only two things you can do to have a compounding wealth machine from a business perspective. You either sell shit people don't stop buying or you get people to sell for you that never stop selling. Three years from now, if all the people you signed up this year are not paying you still, you don't have a compounding machine. You have to keep hunting every single month. It's very tiring and you don't get credit for the work you did a few years ago. Contrast that with something like someone who's in wealth management. As soon as they get someone's funds and they invest them, people stay for like 20 years. They get paid for work they did five years ago. And so if we're in a business that is more transactional, then finding people to always sell for you, that's where affiliates and things like that come in. It's like, if you know, for example, that you can make deals with local businesses that will send you leads on a regular basis. And as soon as you turn that node on, they will consistently supply you with five customers a month. That means you did a deal with a business and two years later, they're still sending you five customers a month. Now, you don't have customers that stay forever, but you have an affiliate that does. The guys who do semis, the guys who get their churn below 3%, make significantly more money profit-wise than everybody else. If you can focus on solving that problem, the making money part is significantly easier because you stop having to reinvent the wheel every month and pull another rabbit out of your ass because you get credit for shit you did six months ago. If you still had a gym, uh, would you prefer less staff who are killers who divide the task or more people divided to the different roles? I would have the absolute simplest model possible. I would probably run, and again, this is me, so I have a different skill set. I would probably be running all high ticket semi-private. One manager incentivized off profit share, one guy in the morning, one guy in the afternoon part-time. 100 members, 500 grand a year. 50% margins, 1,500 square feet, three, 4,000 a month in rent tops in a nice retail spot. How do you take premium service to luxury? Is it price-based or is it based for status? The fundamental thing that separates luxury from premium, premium is like an above average service, like Lexus is premium, a Ferrari is luxury. Luxury goods increase in demand as you increase the price. But the key part of making something a luxury good is that it confers status to the buyer as a function of its price. So if you just charge a lot of money, that doesn't necessarily make you a luxury. There has to be status associated with your brand. That's why branding is so important. Is the how much you spend on fitness something you brag about to anyone? Probably not. So I wouldn't try and think of this is like, how do I go to luxury? I'd be like, how do I make my thing so good that I get all the rich people to refer their rich friends because then they get status through the referral. Like you look great. Yeah, 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 this guy's awesome. He's so good. And then they get status because they help their friend out because you're actually good. I appreciate you guys. I promise that it is going to get worse if you don't stay disciplined. So stay disciplined. Don't splurge on stuff. Do your big list of should do's. Don't get distracted on things you know you shouldn't do. In your gut, you know you shouldn't do a bunch of stuff and do it anyway. Stop doing that, right? Look at the constraint of the business, over deliver on the customer, and you'll be fine.